Welcome to Cohen Auditorium. Please take a moment to note the locations of the emergency exits. There are four on the main floor, two in the front, and two in the rear, as well as two exits in the balcony. In the event of an evacuation, walk to the nearest exit, and once outside, move a safe distance from the building, allowing others to exit behind you. The program will start in just a moment. Now please silence your cell phones and other devices. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tufts University President Tony Monaco. Good evening and welcome to students, faculty, staff, alumni, and friends joining us for tonight's event at Tufts University. And a warm welcome to all the viewers joining us at watch parties across the country. Tufts is thrilled to host the New York Times for tonight's edition of Get With The Times. We at Tufts University are committed to student mental health and well-being, fostering resilience and creating a healthy and supportive community. Openly discussing mental health challenges is a critical step towards reducing stigma, building understanding of the challenges so many of our members in our community face, and advancing society's attitudes surrounding mental health. We are looking forward to hearing Kevin Love share his experience and perspective, and I hope you will all enjoy this evening's program. Now, please join me in welcoming Diane Bainbridge of the Hudson's Bay Company. Thank you, President Monaco. And thank you to all of you and the New York Times, Kevin Love, Tufts University for hosting this event in your beautiful campus, and most importantly, you, the students, for being here today to discuss the critical issue of mental health. Hudson's Bay Company is one of the fastest growing retailers in the world and is the parent company of Saks Fifth Avenue, Saks Off Fifth, Lord & Taylor, and Hudson's Bay in Canada. In 2017, HBC launched the HBC Foundation in the US, uniting all of our charitable efforts with a new philanthropic focus on mental health. Together with our Canadian HBC Foundation, we pledge to distribute $6 million Canadian by 2020 to support mental health programs that provide increased awareness and access to health. We chose to take on the challenge of mental health because it's vital to the communities that we serve. Today, we're excited to announce that we're awarding $300,000 to the Jed Foundation to establish the HBC Foundation campus program. The Jed Foundation provides critical mental health and suicide prevention programming to colleges nationwide through their Jed campus program. The HBC Foundation Fund will help Jed reach its goal of four million students in 2019. To kick off the fund, we're pleased to invite Tufts University into the JED Campus Program as the first recipient of the HBC Foundation Campus Scholarship Fund. Thank you, Tufts, for your dedication to improving student mental health. Today is just the beginning of our partnership that will impact the mental health landscape for young adults nationwide. We're confident that with the right support, everyone will have an equal chance to grow into healthy, productive adults. I would now like to introduce Megan K. Safer from the New York Times. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Megan K. Safer with the New York Times, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to Get With The Times, our live conversation series for college students. Hosted by top journalists paired with famous figures in entertainment, politics, sports, business, and more, the series is all about inspiring young people to get involved in the issues that matter to them the most. 
Tonight, we are thrilled to welcome Kevin Love, who has become a leading voice in the national conversation around mental health awareness. He will be interviewed by the New York Times Sports of the Times columnist, Juliette McCurr. Let's meet our guests. Kevin Love is a leader on the Cleveland Cavaliers and an undeniable force across the entire league. In 11 seasons, Love has laid claim to five all-star selections, an NBA championship, and won a gold medal from both the Olympics and the FIBA World Championships. Off the court, Love has established himself as a philanthropist. He recently launched the Kevin Love Fund, an organization dedicated to inspiring people to live their healthiest lives. Juliette McCurr is an award-winning columnist at the New York Times and a best-selling author. Her recent work includes coverage of the Olympics, she has covered 10 of them in her career, the USA Gymnastics Team's sexual abuse scandal, and investigations into doping in the sports world. In 2016, the Associated Press sports editors named her one of the top 10 sports columnists in the United States. We look forward to what is sure to be a compelling conversation. In the meantime, the New York Times would like to thank our hosts, Tuff University, and our collegiate partner, Her Campus. Tonight's event is supported by the US HBC Foundation, the charitable arm of Hudson's Bay Company that is dedicated to making mental health a priority in every community. I'm so delighted to share that the New York Times is streaming tonight's event to students who are hosting watch parties on college campuses across the country. You'll hear from some of them later this evening. Please join me in welcoming Juliet McCurr and Kevin Love. I'm going to pretend those cheers were for me. Thank you, Kevin. I uh, just wanted to initially just, um, first of all, thank you all for being here. Thank everybody for tuning in on the web and for everybody hosting watch parties all over the country. It's pretty cool that so many people are interested in this very important topic. Um, thanks to Tuck, Tufts University and, of course, thanks to Kevin for taking time out of his, um, his basketball schedule to I'm be with us. No, I'm not doing that much. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but you're not wearing the boot, so that's I'm a not, start. I'm, I'm so, finally out of the boot. So, so you look healthy. Yeah. But um, when I w well, first of all, I wanted to talk about just the the format here. We'll talk for about 30 minutes, about half the time, and then we'll open it up to questions, both from the from the audience here and at the watch parties all over the country. So, so you have 30 minutes to to survive a grilling from me. Okay. See if you could do it. Wish me luck. Sure. Um, when I was initially approached to, to, to talk to Kevin and, and do this interview, I was, I was very honored and excited about it because I feel like as a culture, we don't talk about this issue enough. And, and when we do talk about it, it's always reactive, whether it's um, you know, a tragedy with a celebrity like Kate Spade or Anthony Bourdain, suddenly, suddenly the pages of the New York Times too are filled with stories about uh, mental health awareness and how to uh, prevent suicide and, and how to deal with depression and those type of things. So what uh, really made this a special moment for me, Kevin, was that you're doing this proactively. You know, you're going out to talk about this issue when you don't have to, where you could have had that panic attack last year and nobody would have ever found out about it and, and life would have gone on uh, for everybody and you wouldn't really make the impact that you're making. So I wanted to thank you in advance for the work that you're doing. Um, so it's been almost a year since uh, a day that changed your life. It was November 5th. It was a home game against the Atlanta right Hawks. Half time. Right after halftime. Yeah. Right after halftime. And I think that you said that you, you just didn't feel right all day. No. I didn't feel right all day, and it was a, it was a really odd feeling because there was you know, things outside of basketball that I was dealing with, and... As far as depression and anxiety, it's something that I dealt with my entire life. And when I was younger, I, I didn't quite understand it. I didn't realize why I felt this way. And it manifested uh, in rage fits and in anger. And I always was able to separate myself and had somewhere to go when I was younger. But when 
I had my, my first real life-changing experience with a panic attack. It was November 5th. It was after halftime. I hadn't quite felt right the uh, entire day. Uh, I've been having problems with my family. I've been having uh, you know, other problems away from the court as well um, that were adding to the stress of, of expectation. We were a team that you know, I, got, I was six years in, in Minneapolis where we didn't make the playoffs playing for the Minnesota Timberwolves into, and I got traded. Um, uh, and it was the see it was a 2014-2015 season to a team, the Cleveland Cavaliers, where we were expected to win a championship every year. So expectations went absolutely through the roof. And this was my fourth year. Um, you know, we had played till June every year. We had played in the NBA Finals, and uh, this was another year we went off to. We got off to a really, really slow start. We had made some changes. Uh, Kyrie Irving, who now plays in in, in Boston, had been traded. Uh, who's an unbelievable talent and a generational point guard, but we had got off to a really slow start. So basketball had always been my escape. It had been a way to alleviate stress and, and, and get away from the dark thoughts of, of, of when I'm alone and my mind would uh, go to a very, very deep and dark place. But uh, basketball was at such a low point that everything just manifested into having this panic attack. And I remember we, it was after halftime and it, we had called the first time out because Let's face it, we had played like shit the first two or three minutes. <laughs> and um, I remember coming to the bench and I just couldn't, I couldn't catch my breath. And I, I heard what the coach was saying, what my teammates were saying, the adjustments we had to make, how we were playing, what we had to do. And I just couldn't, I couldn't catch my breath, breath. I could not concentrate on what was going on. So I, I, I left the huddle. Ty Lue had come to me and said something and I just told him, listen, I'll be right back. So, in my younger years, I had a place to, to I had an outlet to, to have these, these rage, rage fits and, and you know, cry and, and, and you know, go into my room and never, you know, not leave for a while, but I had to escape to the locker room and I was essentially looking for something that I couldn't find. And I, I couldn't catch my breath and, and I wasn't getting oxygen and I, basically, I just went to my, my trainer's room and fell on the floor and was gasping for air. And I was sticking my hand down my throat trying to feel like I was getting something out of out of my throat that wasn't there. And I panicked fully, lost my breath, all sweats, and I had you know, come to a point where I thought that I was fully having a heart attack and that I was gonna die. And I had never experienced something quite like that before. And I followed up, you know, they got oxygen for me. Uh, you know, people had met me on the ground just trying to, trying to get me air, get me to calm down. We went to the Cleveland Clinic, one of the best hospitals in the world, and I completely checked out. They said nothing was wrong with me. So that's, uh, you know, when I came to the point, looked myself in the mirror and said, okay, this, it might be time to start addressing, you know, what, what's been going on uh, as early as I can remember, probably my, my younger teenage years. How did you know it was a panic attack? Did the doctor tell you, or did you have a feeling that it, that it might just be psychological? Y yes, but I, I didn't quite understand it until I had really met with the doctors and first, uh, started seeing my therapist and I, I didn't realize or even conceptualize what that was and I, I didn't know that it was even a real thing um, and just going through it um, and I mean listen the stats say that some of you have gone through it as well and it's it's a the first one is frightening uh, I was I was very very scared and put in a very vulnerable position why didn't you want to tell anybody? Um, I think because, I mean, like I said in my, my Players' Tribune article, I, it was so much of growing up and having this playbook. Like, I had a dad who was born in 49, and, you know, his father was very strong and tough, and they had gone through, uh, you know, a, a few wars, and, uh, you know, my dad was you know, 20 years old in, in 1969. Like, think of everything that happened in the 60s. Um, up until, you know, I was born in 88, so my playbook was to just, you know, put all that stuff over here and suppress it, not talk about it, keep your chin up, uh, don't show any emotion, don't cry. And I think as young men, that's what we're taught to do. And I was afraid that my teammates would think I was weak, people would think less of me, and that, you know, I, I, I would be unreliable on the court. And basketball was always my, my way out, it was a way to... It was a form of escapism for me. So I always, you know, basketball was my first love and something that 
brought so much joy in my life from all those dark moments and from all that depression. And I was afraid people in my inner circle away from basketball were, were going to find out and, and you know, I, I didn't know what they were going to think. I think a lot of the time in our lives, whether it be when we're young or college students or you know, up into adulthood, we are scared of the unknown. I wonder, was it magnified because you're, you're a star athlete that you, that you sort of felt, I'm putting words in your mouth, yes. but you felt perfect that, you know, I know from covering sports for a long time that these, um, that athletes are, or at least they feel invincible, okay. or, or we make them invincible. Yeah. Fans think that, We're that you do everything. You're a superhero. Right. So did that make you even more afraid and you might maybe have had a contract coming up, you know, contract negotiations it, that maybe you didn't want to look vulnerable in any way? It definitely did. And actually leading up to telling my story, I mean, we, we uh, had mentioned Jackie McMullen's name, a, a senior writer at ESPN who's one of my favorite people. Um, you know, she had talked to me at, at the All-Star break about, do I need one too? Okay. Um, we had talked about, um, you know, kind of that theory and being vulnerable and, and contracts. And she said, you know, because she was writing her story and then ended up doing a five-part series in August uh, centered around mental health. And she had mentioned there's, there's guys that don't want to come out in the NBA and talk about it because they are worried about their contract. They are worried about, you know, what fr the front office or what ownership would, would, would think of them or would they be unreliable or what their teammates would think or, you know, I have to be able to provide for my family. And, uh, you know, I don't know how long my career is going to last. So, so, you know, being vulnerable and, and, and taking that step and, and, you know, making that sacrifice to allow themselves to, to, to do that was, you know, too much for them. And my story is a little different. Like, I had had my panic attack. Um, you know, I had a very dark period uh, for a couple months leading into the new year. And um, we, weren't, I, we weren't playing well after the new year. We, you know, my team had, I had actually left another game for similar reasons, and my team had turned on me. Uh, and they didn't know really what was going on at the time, so I, I had to tell the guys, I said, hey, listen, you know, I'm dealing with something away from basketball that I'm going to be better for you guys, but on the court, I'm all in. Like, you guys are family. I believe in us. I've been, I've sacrificed so much for this team, and I'm going to do everything I can to get right. And as the conversation continued, uh, Tyron Liu, our, our head coach, had said uh, in response to somebody, um, uh, you know, airing a grievance that, oh, you mean Kevin's panic attack? And I didn't know that anybody knew. Uh, and no, I don't believe a lot of people did know, from whether it be front office all the way down to our training staff. So there was that. There was, um, you know, the rumblings of what had happened after that leading into All-Star break where people were talking about it in Los Angeles last year. That's where uh, our All-Star break was, into Jackie uh, speaking to me. And actually, when I got to All-Star break, that's when Parkland, Florida happened. And I was sitting there thinking, man, what, what, how many people this affects, uh, as well as, uh, you know, the kid, what was he, 18 or 19 years old? Uh, as well as the, the kids whose lives were taken and, you know, the parents that, that had to deal with that and the kids having to go back to school, so on and so forth. So um, I think on, there was a number of things pushing me to tell my story as well as me wanting to tell my own story in my own words because that was, that was something I was, I was worried about, that somebody would get hold of it and it would take on a life of its own rather than it being in my own words. So uh, I wasn't so much worried about um, the repercussions of it. I was just, um, I was a little unsure, uneasy of, 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 of what people would think or how they would view me. Is it working now? There you go. There we go. Um, I'm interested in what your dad thought. I mean, your dad, like you said, your dad was a player himself. He's a pretty tough guy. Or, I mean, most families don't have playbooks, but I'm sure that you did about the rules of the house and just how things, how things went. And I'm wondering yeah. what, what he said and, and sort of how we change that sort of micro way of we, we look at like what it means to be a man. Well, yeah, I think that that, I really believe that that whole conversation has to change as well. Like men have to allow themselves to be, to be vulnerable and to, to express themselves because there's 
you know, there's been so many movements, whether it be LGBT, uh, civil rights, uh, Me Too. I mean, there's so many movements, but, uh, and that's always moving in the right direction and it's not divisive. Like men, I think, are, are so far behind like, that we need to allow ourselves to um, even just, not, it's not changing the culture is the wrong term, it's even speaking a different language in a way. And that's being better men, holding ourselves accountable, but also allowing ourselves to, to be vulnerable and speak our truths because nothing haunts you like, nothing haunts us like the things we don't say for so long. I mean, it haunted me for 29 years of my life or since I could understand it. So, so, so you're, you didn't have a conversation with your dad about I didn't, it? I did have a conversation with my brother though. And so, you know, when you're in it, especially when, when you're in like a really deep depression, and I know some of you can attest to this as well, you just, you don't realize the effect that you're having on people around you. You have blinders on and nobody can really tell you anything. So I remember speaking to my brother, it was maybe, uh, less than a week after I had written the article and the article had come out and you know we went to get a coffee uh, my brother's two years my senior he said I asked him I said you know what did you think and he said you know what Kevin I, I remember when when you were young and there'd be times where we would we he said we would lose you and I go well what do you mean he just said you you would go away for a while and then eventually Kevin would come back and I you know, was taken really aback by that and, and just, I knew that I was, I was going through certain things in that time that I didn't understand, but seeing it from a, somebody who shared the same home as me growing up, I mean, that's the closest that you can be to somebody is your own blood. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't really have any, I couldn't really conceptualize or, or, or see that when I was going through it. And that, I'm not sure if you can explain this now, but if you have somebody in your family or a friend who might be going through these kind of things, like you losing a friend for a couple weeks, you know, from your perspective, what, what could other people do? Well, it's amazing. The, the most amazing thing to come of all of this, and it's been therapeutic for me, is the, the community, um, the community aspect of all of, it, of all of this. And either somebody you know, I really truly believe that everybody is, is going through something, whether it be on a daily basis or whether it be at a point in your life, because we all suffer at the very least loss at some point in our life. Like every, everybody is, is gonna expire at some point. But, um, you know, I really truly believe that, you know, whether it's you or somebody at arm's length uh, to you is, is going through something, but it wasn't until I allowed myself to, to do this that I realized that there was such a big community. Like, you know, we, we had a great intro here about all my accolades, but the, the biggest thing in my 11 year career so far that I've done has, has been this because of, of the community. More people in my entire career have come up to me uh, about sharing my story and, and what I've been dealing with than any other point in my career. So I found that to be super therapeutic, but also, you know, very cool and a big reason of why we're sitting here today, because I believe, um, you know, universally we need it, but, uh, you know, here in America more than any, any time, I think that we've, we've needed it as well. It, so it's amazing that even though you're around tens of thousands of people, you know, when you play basketball and you've been around the world internationally and all these fans and people watching you and wanting your autograph and that you felt alone. I did, and you mentioned, um, Kate Spade and one of my heroes, Anthony Bourdain. I mean, Parts Unknown is, I was just watching it today. Um, he was, you know, a wild story is, um, you know, I've been working actually with the Players Tribune. I'm working on, you know, potentially doing a show um, that's in somewhat a, a, a tribute to him. But uh, in that week, you know, Kate Spade had taken her life and Anthony Bourdain, it was, I woke up and checked my phone and uh, it was game four of the NBA Finals. And that just completely shut me off for uh, not only that day, but a little while. But I remember I was uh, cleaning up my home and, and ready to, you know, we had our exit meetings ready to leave for the, for the off season. I had all this legal pad paper of, um, you know, pages of notes just going over, you know, I think it was like five or six seasons of, of uh, parts unknown. I just sitting there like, wow. Um, you know, it's, this is, you know, really wild. And Brian Cranston, who I'm a big Breaking Bad fan and a huge fan of his as well, he came out after that and said, uh, success is not immune to depression. So, 
Uh, it doesn't discriminate. I mean, this is a universal thing. It's not uh, about race, gender, sexual preference, socioeconomic status, uh, demographic, what age you are. I mean, this, this relates, and this, I think, hits home for everybody. What bothered you the most about Anthony Bourdain's suicide? That he was so universally loved and well-liked, and it felt like, you know, he had, he had, had money, he had traveled the world, you would felt like you traveled the world with him. Um, beautiful uh, child, girlfriend, um, you know, had a TV show that everybody loved, uh, you know, had been through it. He was so relatable in so many ways. And uh, I mean, that's why I just I couldn't get enough of, of him or his show because he was just real. He was an authentic person that seemed to essentially have everything. And, uh, you know, it just felt like we had lost uh, a great Samaritan, a great person, a person who stood for all the right things. And he had the best job in the world. He got, to, he got to go all over the world and ask questions like, you know, what makes you happy? What's it like here? What kind of food do you eat? And like he said, you'd be amazed at the answers you'd get. So that was, that was a, uh, you know, somebody that I'll always remember as a, as a bright spot and uh, in a lot of ways try to live my life like. Could you empathize with him? I mean, totally. obviously you're very likable people, you know, are, are your fans and you, you have, seem to have everything in the right. world. You have a $120 million contract, right. not too shabby. <laughs> <laughs> I had to throw that in, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you know, it seems like that, that you had some things in common with him. I wonder if that's what really hurt you the yeah, most. Yeah, it did, him. and it's tough to find like that was something I was really uh, worried about because we have these annual meetings with the Players Tribune or um, you know with my my agency and, and we always talk about like especially now how are we going to find ways to to you know how are how are people going to express empathy or or you know commiserate's a funny thing to say but you know f find empathy when you seemingly do have everything but people it manifests and people suffer in different ways and I think that. You, you mentioned money, like money doesn't, it doesn't make you unhappy, but it's, it's just not the only currency that, that truly matters. Like I think that more, if I, uh, we have this thing on the Players Tribune where we actually write a letter to our younger self. And for me, my emphasis was always to, oh, it's gonna be a business and, and you're gonna have to make money, but that doesn't solve everything. Yeah, it's good to have, but if I could, look back and tell myself I would, I would generate more of my energy and, and have more of an emphasis, emphasis on creating more time because you can always, you can always make more money. Um, it's gonna fluctuate throughout your life how much you're gonna make. And with time, you're, not, you're never gonna have any less, in it, less of it than you have right now. It's fast fleeting and you, know, you, can't, you can't buy any more of it. So, I, I always feel like that's, that's something that I would tell my younger self because, you know, I look back in, in, in the rear view uh, and everything seems to, to, to be clearer, but I'm one of those guys that said, man, I, I, I would have changed, had I had the presence of mind, I would have changed how I thought about certain things, but also I would have just enjoyed the moment more. You spent all these years feeling alone and, and it manifests itself in different ways. So you write this Players' Tribune article, which right. was obviously very powerful. Uh, you press send, and then I think, did you say 6,000 6, emails <laughs> within 72 hours? So that's suddenly you go from feeling really alone yeah. uh, uh, to 6,000 people right. surrounding you with, um, I'm, I'm assuming most of it was positive. I, I don't know if you remember one particular there's email that really stood out to you? Can you describe? So them? many, even to today, on all my social media platforms. Um, but yeah, I, I press send. I remember talking to my agent literally the night before. Uh, I did press send, and he said, are you sure you want to do this? Because it's going to be, it's going to be big. And I thought, maybe. Uh, but if I'm, if I'm able to just affect that, that, one, that one kid or that one person who's suffering, like I was, um, that's going to make that's going to make all the difference. But I didn't realize how vast the community was. It was like I, uh, you know, I just did 23 and Me, signed up for 23 and Me, and did, you know, saw where I came from and all that. So like I pressed send, and then then I had this like global family all of a sudden of of people that had 
Um, you either had a kid that had gone through something or they had gone through something themselves, and that was super impactful. Like you said, we had uh, close to 6,000 emails, I believe, within the first 72 hours, uh, and we tried to, <laughs> we, we had put it out there that we tried to respond to, to every single one, but it just it kept coming in and kept coming in and kept coming in. So I think just, just being where we are today and, and, and setting up the fund and, and working with people like uh, Bring Change to Mind and just keep living and having a strategic partner um, with headspace for meditation and finding different ways to, to impact the masses and the people uh, in, a, in a big way has been you know, very therapeutic. The community has been large and vast and I think uh, you know, affecting the younger demographic and, and continue to, to implement new ways to, to just beat down the stigma, but also learn what you're going through in, in many different ways is, is gonna be key. So that's, I'll just end with this, with this answer is that I, in the last year, I've just started doing the work. So I know that I don't know as, as I'm not gonna say as much as I should, but I'm, I'm really trying to soak up and be a sponge as, as learn as, and learn as much as I can because I've just started to do the work now. So there's, there's gonna be a lot to learn, but uh, you know, I enjoy being a leader in this space because I think not only is it much needed, but we're gonna be able to impact um, a lot of people. So um, can you just talk about the emotions of maybe your agent telling you that 6,000 emails came in or um, what did you learn about yourself and and you writing this, the article when you realized that 6,000 people had responded in such a quick time? Um, I think just that, just that, it, you know, it didn't matter. Uh, I think the, the biggest, the craziest thing that happened to me was a super close friend had, uh, <laughs> it's, sorry, it's not funny, but it, the, the article had, had impacted him in such a heavy way that, and I'm not saying it, it, it should, this is how it should happen, but he, it was impacted, so it hit him so close to home and so close, like to the heart and to the head that he <laughs> didn't go to work for three days, watch you. I don't know, that's kind of a funny way to. Does he play in the NBA? No, no he doesn't. <laughs> this is one of my, my good friends from back home, but he, uh, he was just so moved and impacted by it that he just, he just needed a moment. But it, it was, um, I guess he needed more than just a moment. He needed a few <laughs> days. But no, it was, uh, it was just really eye-opening to me. Just somebody that I had never known was really going through something like that. You know, from my agent saying this is going to be big and you know, more people are going to pick this up than you think to... Uh, you know, then so many emails, and even to today, I, it's, it's, it's just been a, a wild uh, six or seven months, so I'm still figuring out all the ways that, that you know, we can impact, um, you know, people in a, a really positive way. Um, like you said, you've done a lot. It hasn't, it's been a year since the panic attack. I feel like you've really been doing a lot of things, a lot of different outreach, and one of them um, were a web series uh, where you shaved your shaved your yeah. facial hair for it because it was sponsored by Chic, right? Locker room talk, yeah. <laughs> locker room, yeah, locker room talk. Look. I, I don't like myself with a shaved face, but yeah, I didn't recognize you. It was, yeah. it was pretty surprising, but um, <laughs> uh, but I but I watched the episodes and there's various um, other famous athletes. Um, uh, Michael Phelps. My, thank you, Michael Phelps. Yep, Channing Fry, Channing Fry, Paul Pierce, who played in Boston. So and uh, and it's yeah. Uh, shout out to Paul Pierce, but. Uh, um, uh, <laughs> What was really powerful for me when I was watching it was just, uh, just never seen anything like it. Um, I've covered sports for, oh, I think it's been 20 years, and I would never dream that two professional athletes would be talking about the things that you were talking about in this, in this web series. And I, I, I suggest everybody look it up. I mean, they're really short. They're about five minutes each. Um, but in one, I think you and Channing Fry were talking about, it was a lot in five minutes, you were talking about grief. He, he had lost both of his parents. Both of his parents within a within, month. Within a month. And, um, and you, uh, I know that you had lost your, your grandma, Carol. Yes. Um, and she was, maybe, maybe you could tell us a little bit about what grandma Carol meant to you and, <laughs> and just the fact that you hadn't worked through that grief, sure. um, you know, it, up to the point of the panic attack. Well, that was one of the first things I, I realized that I was holding on to for so long. Because I mentioned 
time earlier and not being able to, to, to get that time back. And I, th I was so singularly focused when I was young. And I think in a lot of ways I had blinders on with that. Like I didn't, I think what makes us happy is, is, is doing things for others and spending time with, with close ones, whether it be friends or family, among other things. But my, my grandmother stood for all the right things. She had great morals, great character. She had lived her life vicariously through her family. And that was number one, that's all that mattered. And I you know, had been a little bit jaded getting into the NBA, and I, you know, been, I was 19, put into a, uh, uh, a situation where I was making millions of dollars, and I just had one thing in mind, and, and my goal was to just, I mean, get every ounce that I could out of this basketball thing where I forgot to then make a life. And my grandma, uh, I had seen her in the summer, but I would, I would spend you know, a couple minutes at my house, go and see her, and not, really put in that, that, that quality time with her to where uh, she had never been out to Minnesota and this was my, uh, this is 2013, so this is my sixth year um, um, in Minnesota and she was supposed to come out for Thanksgiving and she hadn't been, we hadn't been to a Thanksgiving together uh, you know, since I was in high school. So 2007 was my senior year of high school. And uh, you know, some plaque had gone up to her brain. She had um, you know, a lot of medical problems that had, had led to uh, a stroke. Uh, she never got better and she had, um, she had died soon thereafter. So a lot of that time that I wish I had spent um, and wish I could have back was gone. And I never had grieved after that because I had um, you know, just gone right back into the season and you know, it always man manifested itself in di different ways, but that stuff was tucked away, deep-seated. I wasn't able to grieve really until, until last year. So um, having gone through that as well, that's why I was able to empathize and, and, and be there with Channing when he had, because we had lockers right next to each other uh, in our locker room and we always put next to each other uh, uh, on the road as well. So when he had lost both parents, that was a tough see thing to see such a close friend go through but uh, I think those shared experiences and, and just being uh, either an ear or a shoulder for him or a uh, drinking buddy was, uh, was something where I could, I could uh, you know, really help him and just, uh, you know, everybody has their way to, to you know, it doesn't have to be a professional. Everybody has their way to, to air things out and, and, you know, air grievances or something that they're, that they're going through. And, you know, with Channing, it was through his, his teammates because that was his way of, of, you know, getting away from it all. Now, you mentioned in July on Instagram, you posted a picture of, of Grandma Carol and said uh, something like, I, I wish you were here right now, which uh, made me just realize that, or, or maybe you can explain how it, you know, these things, just because you had a panic attack, went to a therapist right. and have been in therapy, doesn't mean, you know, suddenly Kevin Love is 100%. Sometimes yeah. you're it, not it okay. It actually got right? worse before it got better. And so... How do you explain that to people, or what, what kind of advice can you give people who are struggling through something and you know, uh, haven't been to a therapist or maybe, maybe would want to go to the therapist for the first time? I know you, you and Channing talked a lot about that, too, in this, in this web series where they started uh, talking about what it's like to see a therapist for the first time. Yeah. And it was, let me tell you, it was, like, it was pretty awesome to see two men talk about <laughs> just like how cool it is to, to tell your problems to somebody else and how, how natural it is and how... Right. Um, just, it was just like a wonderful moment. So I'm wondering, you know, how, how do you cope these days? Um, you know, there's a lot of, lot of ways that I relieve, uh, you know, certain things in my life. Like uh, with stress, I've, I've learned to do, uh, it's always been, you know, basketball, whether it be working out. I love, I love to work out, so that in itself will. Wait, hold on. Before you talk about the, how, you, how you deal with your stress, I think a student has a question about that. Okay, so, okay, sorry. I, 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 so, but, but let me just ask you for the last, last my question is, um, just uh, are you happy now or are, are you happier because you finally you know, let, this, uh, let this burden go or let somebody else carry, carry the weight for you a little bit? It's, I think, like perfection, it's like happiness is like a moving target. I think there's times in your life where you're, obviously, uh, you know, happier than, you know, certain situations or certain things that happen uh, uh, throughout because each day is going to bring a different challenge. Each day is going to, 
uh, you know, pose you know, something that you may not be ready for or you're not going to meet expectations. But I think it's, it's almost like a, uh, I was talking about today, like, a, like a, a quiet joy. Like people expect it to be so great all the time and it has to be this like elation and uh, you know, euphoric experience the entire time. But um, I, I think in some ways, in a lot of ways, that's, that's unrealistic. But just taking your time to, to you know, have gratitude and look around you and think, okay, this is, this is a great life. I've, I've met, uh, you know, I have everything uh, that I would need. I have all my basic needs met. You know, what do I really need after that? It's, it's you know, that quality time with family. It's, it's friends. It's doing things for others. It's, uh, you know, making a gratitude uh, journal and, and making sure that you're, you're just, you know, giving thanks and, and, and trying, to, trying to better your life. I think more than any time in my life, I've been more comfortable in my own skin. And I've had you, I live by the saying that, uh, you know, only by admitting who we are do we get what we want. So I had to, you know, pass the mirror test and look at myself in the mirror and say, okay, you know, how, how can I be a better version of me? Because I think, like I said, that, um, that perfection is, is always uh, a mo moving target, and we're all a work in progress. Like, it's, it's never just, it's never going to be perfect. And you have to, uh, once you realize that and, and realize that everybody's going through something and we have this uh, vast community uh, that's universal, that you're going you're gonna to be a lot happier. Thanks. Now, now we have some questions from students. I think we're going to um, start out with a, a video question from a, a watch party at Baylor University. Hi, my name is Brian Laughlin. I go to Baylor University. My question is, if you had advice for a college student, either athlete or not, what would it be? That's a real specific, specific answer. <laughs> advice? <laughs> Yeah, for a college student um, or athlete, uh, you know, I think in, in a lot of ways I, I, you know, had 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 just said it like, um, you know, with with success or with perfection, I think that we're we're all a work in progress. Like I said, it's it's something that um, you know we're all working towards. Um, but I, I would say, you know, t take a minute. Take a minute to breathe. Know that things have a way, universe, the universe has a way of unfolding things uh, and, and working themselves out. And, um, you know, if, if I feel like if, you know, you are going through something or you, know, you see somebody that is going through something, just, just pay it forward. Find a way to, to impact somebody's life in a very positive way because you never know, you never know, uh, you know, really how far that could go. Uh, for someone, I know that I, you know, if I would have just known that one of my uh, my friends when I was young was 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 uh, struggling, or you know, they had been able to express that to me, that wouldn't have been able to to help me more. But that that whole language and that thought process when you're young is 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 not there. So I think that that is something. The reason, one of the reasons we're here, and um, you know, we're going to find a way to to elicit that change. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Brennan, for that question. Uh, next question is, uh, is from right here. Um, yeah, hello. Okay, well, there you are. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Hi, my name is there Joshua Clarkson, okay. uh, and I'm a sophomore student here at Tufts. And my question is, how did your expectations of how people would react to the telling of your mental health story compare with how they reacted in reality? I was... <sighs> I was very, uh, shaken up is the wrong term, but I was very uneasy about how, pe how it would be received. But I think like anything in life, you, you make up or you manufacture these things in your brain that uh, he just went dark. I don't know what happened. I, he is not there anymore. <laughs> <He's> not there. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, so I think you manufacture these these moments or thoughts in your brain where you think things are going to be so much worse than they are. And, uh, you know, I mentioned that rear view mirror earlier. You look back, you thought, man, that, was, that wasn't so bad. So uh, that's exactly what happened. I know there was a, uh, it was universally pretty much well received in, in uh, as far as the Players' Tribune article went. But yeah, leading up to it, I was, 
I was very uneasy because this, uh, this wasn't a, a, a bridge I had crossed ever before. This wasn't something that I was comfortable sharing to the masses at this point, to where I clicked one button and then a lot of people knew. So it, it wasn't like a lot of things in life, you know, you look back and it wasn't as bad as, as you made it up to be in your brain. Um, so, you know, I think, I know a lot of you in this room or each and every one of you in this room have it in you to, to have courage and, and to have the next person and allow yourselves to, to, to be a certain way and be positive and, and make that change. So I think that that's, that can only be a good thing. Okay, um, next question comes video from the University of Illinois. Hi, Kevin, it's Maggie. Um, I'm a student from the University of Illinois at Chicago, and I was wondering, how did the team respond to your article in the Players' Tribune? The team. How did the team respond? How did the team respond? That was awesome. You guys know each other? Yeah. It was... <laughs> they go way back? Yeah, it's Maggie again. <laughs> oh, Mags. <laughs> um... How did the team respond? It was, um, it was, uh, I remember we had traveled to, we did, we headed to, uh, we met at the plane and headed to Denver um, that afternoon. And I remember we were, you know, on the bus. And when our bus had stopped at the, at the hotel, you know, we had sat in this, uh, this group of, of veterans in the back and, you know, the two guys that, um, we're back there with me. We're Kyle Corver, who, you know, RIP, just got traded to, uh, <laughs> just got traded to Utah, which is my guy. I uh, poured a little out for him last night, so we're good. Uh, so Kyle was back there and just, just, he had just mentioned that he, he, he wanted to help. He wanted to uh, find a way to, to, to jump on board. And I said, like, Kyle, this is, you know, the first six hours. Like, I, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not sure where this is going to go. And he said, well, you know, when you do cross that bridge, I, I want to be a part of it. So that was comforting and, and uh, you know, relieved a lot of uh, um, the anxiety around how it was going to be perceived by my teammates. And then uh, LeBron, LeBron had um, pulled me aside when we were walking off the bus and, and you know, had shook my hand and, and basically... Um, he had told me that he said today you would you, you helped a lot of people and you know that's coming from a guy who just uh, you know has poured so much money into you know helping kids you know, internationally globally but also um, you know has his I Promise school in, in, in Akron as well who has done so much to further conversations and, and, and be such a pillar in so many movements so that was a that was a special moment as well just knowing that. Um, you know, I had the team support, had his support, and uh, no, no, nobody was quiet about it either. It was, it was out there that they, um, you know, supported me, and I was very thankful for that. I wonder if that helps you get through your own struggles that you're helping other people at the same time. For sure, and it also helped me in, I mean, for, for, I'll get to that in a second, but also it helped me um, in going to work as well, knowing that I could be comfortable uh, knowing that I, that, I, that I am flawed, that I am a, a work in progress, and, and you know, that I have a number of things to, to work on, um, like anybody. But, um, yeah, I think being able to help people has been, um, you know, probably, uh, it's definitely the best part about all of this. And I feel like, you know, I was always so caught up or anxious in, in you know, what am I going to do after basketball? And I... I you know, I turned 30 in September and, you know, I was heading into my, uh, and now in my 11th year in the league and, you know, you, you cross that path of thinking like, okay, I'm, I'm, even if I were to play 20 years, I'm still over the hill. I'm in year 11. So what, that creeps into your mind, like, okay, what am, what am I going to do after basketball? Because you're burning the candle at both ends and, um, you know, unless you're LeBron James, you're just not going to last forever. So, we, uh, um, that was something that crept into my mind and now I feel like, um, you know, I found something that's, that's, that's very meaningful and that I'll be able to work on for, you know, hopefully the rest of my life. Yeah, a bigger purpose. Bigger purpose, right. exactly. Um, now back to the darkness in the back of the room there. Uh, we have an in-person question from Pamela. Hi, my name is Pamela Toscano. I'm a senior at Tufts. 
My question is, how have you seen mental health in sports, specifically basketball, change and evolve throughout your career? That's a good question. The, uh, well, you'd mentioned the, um, the uh, I just have a feeling that fucking light's going to go off any second. <laughs> no. <laughs> like, such a little kid. Uh, I'll hold your hand I'm waiting if it goes for, dark. Yeah, thanks. Um, no, it's, it's definitely changed to a point where, um, you know, people are very forward and forthcoming in talking about it. Um, I've, at least in, in my personal experience, I've become a person that, especially in this past year, that's just been like, um, really laid it all out on the line and just said, hey, listen, this, this is what you get. It's part of being comfortable in my own skin. It's also part of being 30, because I was told after 30, you kind of start, stop giving a shit about the little things. But <laughs> am I cursing too much? Am I good? My mom's watching, so. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> no. uh, Sorry, mom. No, so I, I, I've been a per person that's just kind of laid all my cards out there and said, this is what you get. And I think that has um, been something that has taken, taken a whole lot of time. I mean, I can, uh, going back to LeBron for a second, I can, I can remember uh, even just this past week or two and, and when he had uh, decided to, you know, he had the decision, he decided to go to Miami, like he, he had talked about, and this is like, this is the best athlete, best player in the world here we're talking about. And he talked about, I wanted to be, well, I want to be liked by everyone. And finally, he just, he, he had let that go, and that gave him, um, you know, a real sense of freedom in his brain. And I felt that to be, you know, extremely powerful because, uh, you know, there's such a, there's such a, I mentioned Anthony Bourdain, there's such a, the, the common thread of authenticity is, is so huge. You shouldn't be anybody but yourself. Um, and I think I, I fought that for a long time. I saw this, this, this box or this image of, of somebody that I had to be, but I think the, the, the rawness and the, the being vulnerable and, and allowing myself to just, you know, just walk the walk of being myself and being comfortable in my own skin t took a lot of practice and a lot of time, but um, I feel like I'm still, still getting there, but I've, I've, I've taken a huge step. But as, as far as mental health and... Uh, you mentioned Chick Hydro, like, um, uh, you know, with, with Channing, every, everybody has their own, their own story, their own story to tell. Like uh, Paul Pierce, he had, uh, I was saying nine times a week ago, he'd been stabbed nine times, it was 11 times. He stabbed 11 times and had a um, really weird, uh, well, it's not weird, but he had a, a, a thing about being in crowds that gave him a, a huge social anxiety. So that was, that was, his story and his thing that he had to really overcome uh, from an anxiety aspect. Uh, and Channing Fry, he had lost both of his parents in uh, one month, but also he had had a year of his career where uh, he had a heart condition and was taken away, the game was taken away from him. Now, he had people from the organization or his organization he was playing with at the time tell him that he'd never play again. And he had, I think, just had his second child and was you know, talking to his, his wife, Lauren, and, and saying, I, you know, I'm, how am I gonna be able to provide for my family and how am I going to be able to, you know, put food on the table when, um, you know, this game that I love and this, this escape and this, this out has, um, has been taken away from me. And then Michael Phelps, he's been very vocal and very upfront about, you know, what, what he has dealt with uh, really on a daily basis to point where, uh, you know, he had talked about taking his own life. So I think it's a... Uh, um, you know, I know those are only men that I talked about, but there's there's a lot of um, a lot of men and women from from every sport that uh, are dealing with something. So I think that 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 change and 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 uh, you know I mentioned the the language and that stigma just needs to continue to be beaten down. And I think uh, as athletes, because we have such a a, a wide or a, or a long reach in in um, you know who we can. Uh, you know, really speak to and how many followers we have or social media that we can, we can impact a lot of people for the better. Yeah, you, I, I neglected to mention this earlier, but DeMarcus DeRozan, I guess. DeMar, yes. I'm sorry, DeMar, sorry about that. Uh, DeMarcus uh, Cousins, that's a, um, that's a different sorry. story. <laughs> um, in, was it in February? Mid-February, mid yes. he just, uh, uh, he, um, he tweeted something, something like, you know, this depression is depression getting gets the best, best of yeah. me. 
and and uh, and from that, this outpouring of of support yeah. came came forward. And then he wrote a, a story with the uh, Toronto Sun newspaper. Yeah. And then a couple of weeks later, you came out in the Players Tribune. So just one top athlete right. writes one thing on Twitter, and uh, it helps him feel not alone. Yeah. And and other people think they're not alone either. And it's just the power that you guys have that's way beyond the basketball and court. He he can't go unnoticed. I mean, he was. He was the person that, and we still keep in contact. Like I've been, you know, since he had been traded from Toronto to San Antonio, he he was been something that I've been someone I've been in contact with because he he had really opened the door for me. And uh, you know, when he had talked about that, he it made me feel more. It made me feel normal in a way. Like okay, I'm not the only one in the league that's that's you know really going through this and has been dealing with this for for so long. And he's such a high impact, high you know, all NBA type player. And he's, he's admitting that, um, you know, that he's going through this and he's from, you know, the inner city, uh, in Los Angeles. And he's, that's, that's not easy to admit, uh, or I can't imagine it could be easy to admit when, uh, you know, you're from such a rough neighborhood and, uh, you know, thinking about how, how people are going to see that. Now, we're going back to a video question. You could continue answering the question that I cut you off with it's earlier. Okay. It's, okay. Uh, it's a video question um, from a student at the University of Massachusetts. Hi, my name's Jenna, and I'm a student athlete at UMass Lowell, and I'm curious, what are the three ways you help manage your stress? Okay, so that was there the question. There we go. How yeah, do you yeah. manage your stress? You can okay. <laughs> continue, um, pick up where you left off. I would say exercise. I mean, that, uh, like I say, it goes without saying, but I, even outside of basketball, I've always been somebody that's, that's um, really loved to exercise. I'd say I'm, I grew up in Portland, Oregon. I was born in Los Angeles, but I grew up in Portland, Oregon. So, um, you know, I, I, I like to be in nature. I like to you know, put my feet in the grass or just even go outside and get fresh air. I think that can be, you know, just being around the elements can, can uh, be very relieving or very... Um, uh, just make you feel a, a sense of, of, of being grounded. It's like I said, that kind of quiet joy where you look around and think, wow, this is, this is, this is great, this is beautiful. Um, what else? I would say dogs. <laughs> I mean, who doesn't love dogs? Yeah, I mean, come dogs, on. Right? <laughs> do, you have a, do you have a dog? Uh, no, Probably I'm thinking, not. I'm thinking about it, though. Um, you know, because they, they uh, I guess you're, from what science says, like, you, you know, you, you live a three to five more years and, uh, your anxiety goes down around dogs, and uh, you know I have a not not a, I'm not going to tell the joke on here, but it's the one about you know you put the people in the trunk, you open up the trunk, who's happy to see you, the dog. So anybody know that one? <laughs> All right. Um, uh, <laughs> you want to want to tell the whole joke? <laughs> oh, oh, and then I have to say this too. Uh, now I'm afraid of your answer. No, 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 no. Uh, no, I'd say I've learned to my, my uncle, um, who's been a performer for, uh, you know, 50 plus years now, he... You can say who your uncle is, maybe? He's actually here. I'm actually going to his concert after this, yeah. He's actually performing in Boston tonight. Um, he, uh, he's the lead singer for the, right. for, for the Beach Boys. I don't know if that means anything to you guys, but... <laughs> Um, he says it with such, oh, yeah, my uncle's I a, don't, I, you know, I never know. The Beach what, Boys are a band for, for all of you college students. <laughs> you might want to explain that. Okay. So, Slightly uh, popular way back in the day. Yeah, right. So he's done T, uh, uh, TM, Transcendental Meditation, for, for, I mean, even longer than that. So he, um, he's adopted that form of meditation, and it's, it's really, really helped him. And I've... Uh, uh, you know, I've used Headspace, which is, you know, out of Santa Monica where I was born, so that also makes it fun. I've used Headspace as a way to even just take like a minute a day, whether it be to relieve anxiety, whether it be, um, uh, you know, try to help you sleep. And there's anywhere from literally taking one minute a day to, you know, they have, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 minute uh, uh, steps, and they have levels to all of it where, you know, I'm a big... I'm a big uh, list or check maker, so, or uh, I like to check things off, to-do list, I should say. Um, so that they have those type of things where you can accumulate, um, you know, just checking things off the box and, and, and working on different forms of meditation. So I think that that is another way. 
All right, we'll try to hurry up and get through the next couple of questions. Um, I know our time is running short. We have another in-person question. Hi, um, I'm Ayub. I'm a junior here at Tufts University. And my question is, if you could have dinner with someone who inspires you, either dead or, dead or alive, and just kind of pick their brain, who would you pick and why? Well, I think I alluded to it earlier was, that's a fun question too, by the way, is, uh, you know, you know, everybody always talks about, well, who are the three people? But Anthony Bourdain, I would, I mean, because first of all, he loves, I mean, he knows food. He's been in the kitchen, <laughs> like, that's obvious. But um, I just, uh, he's another guy, like, he's been everywhere. It feels like he's essentially done everything. And um, he has this, he had this saying the first season of his show. He was talking about a friend of his and how he, how he envy, envied him. But he was, he said he was, uh, relentlessly curious without fear or prejudice. And I thought to myself, that is an amazing way not only to travel but to, but to live your life. So just being able to, to pick his brain, um, you know, from what primitive questions like, you know, where, where your, you know, where's your favorite place you've been all the way to, um, you know, I'd like to ask him mental health questions or how, how long he's been, been dealing with that, what would have helped him um, and then, you know, depending on how long I had, that'd be, that'd be, uh, that'd be an interesting, interesting conversation and somebody that I'd, I'd, you know, really enjoy spending time with because I have a list. I make a ton of notes on my phone as well, and it's almost like a checklist, as I said in the last answer. But he was, uh, he was somebody that, um, you know, really inspired me, and I wanted to pick his brain, and he was one of those people I had made on my list uh, this past summer that I wanted to meet and, and potentially shadow on a job and you know he's not here anymore so he would be very likely the number one. That's a great answer and you're guaranteed to have a good dinner. Guaranteed. Right? He's probably going to yeah. pick a good place. Um, next question is a video question from uh, University of Louisville. Hi, my name is Joseph Thompson and I'm a senior at the University of Louisville. How has sharing your personal story shaped your career overall? I kick out of that one too. How has it shaped my career overall? Um, These are tough questions, but, I, but yeah, they're good no, questions. I think that uh, it's a good question. Um, it, I think that it's, as you mentioned, it's, it, it, it's given me a, a higher purpose. If, like I said earlier, if you would have told me I would have been sitting here at, at, at 30 years old discussing uh, mental health, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have believed you. I, I, I never thought I'd, I'd, I just thought that this was something I'd just be dealing with or that it was normal, that at, in the pit of my stomach or, or in my brain that this is just something that I was just going to have to deal with. Don't talk about it. Suppress it. It's going to manifest itself in different ways throughout my life. But, um, you know, this is basically what, what life is. Um, and, you know, now that I'm, I'm sitting here today uh, in my 11th year, it's, it's um, you know, giving me a, just a higher purpose. And I think that is, um, I'm very, very thankful for that. I know there, with that comes responsibility. But, like I said backstage, it's something that I'm comfortable talking about and something that, I've lived like it's it's not this is not something that I really prepare for. I just try to speak speak my truth and you know, speak from the heart because I, I've I've lived it for as long as I can remember, or you know even you know, longer than I could understand it. And I still think that that understanding is uh, like that perfection I talked about earlier is is a moving target. Um, in person question from Melissa. Hi, my name is Melissa Manzo. I'm a sophomore here at Tufts. Um, I was just wondering, has it gotten easier to share your story over time, or do you still find it difficult sometimes? Um, you know, I, me I mentioned that responsibility aspect of it all, to be completely honest with you. It's like um, you, had, you had worked with Allie Raisman before, and, um, you know, I have a really good friend of mine, and uh, that's very close with her, and she mentions, yeah, it's, it's sometimes the, the responsibility uh, is a lot because she, she's so powerful and such a force in nature that she, she 
just like has this aura about her that everybody wants to talk to her. And she's so well-spoken and so articulate and such a beautiful woman that she just, everybody wants to, to share their stories and, and, and tell how proud of, you know, how proud of her they are and uh, so on and so forth. So it's, it's, I think in some ways it's that, it's that time you try to reach the masses, you try to talk to everybody, but just being able to, um, you know, find the time for everyone is, is sometimes hard to do, but that's part of the, uh, it is a, it's a small price to pay, but that responsibility is, is something that uh, I've accepted and, and taken into account, but it's moments like last night, we're in Oklahoma City, and there's a guy that uh, brings us food after the game. He, he mentioned, hey, can I just pull you aside and, and talk to you about uh, my son who has constant panic attacks? He goes, I just want to tell you, I showed him your story and, and how much that, that impacted him, because, you know, he's a uh, you know, a fan of basketball. Um, I said, well, he's not a fan of me. No. <laughs> uh, so, uh, no, he shared that story with me, and that's what makes, makes me feel good and what um, allows me to, to, to see the bigger picture overall. Okay, final video question from Siena College. Hi, my name is Sammy and I go to Siena College. My question is, what steps can we take to ensure that conversations like this continue to happen in the sports world? Um, I just, I, I really feel like there's, I feel like there's strength in numbers. I think everybody has their own time of, of, of when they feel like they can share what they're going through or their truths or somebody in their life uh, who's been dealing with somebody, something, but, um, no, I think it's, it's, it's things like these. It's, it's like, uh, you know, uh, a Michael Phelps or a, or a, or a Channing Frye uh, or Allie, like we mentioned earlier, like d discussing these, these topics that, that, that aren't easy. And I think that's how you further. I think it's you guys, uh, you know, sitting here today. It's word of mouth. I hope that, I pray that you guys got something from this. Um, I know I can go all different sort of ways and be long-winded, but it's, it's, I think that there are those strength in numbers. I think that, um, you know, we can we can work, you know, as a as a community and as a group to to help solve this and help help figure these these tough topics out. And I think that that's that's something as as humans that we can, uh, you know, help better each other in in such a uh, a tough social climate. Okay. Uh, final. Final question from a student right there. Hi. Oh. Hi, my name is Allison Cohen. I'm a freshman here at Tufts. I'm also from Cleveland, huge fan, so thank you for being here. <laughs> um, my question is, what is the biggest life lesson you've learned while being a professional athlete? <sighs> well, I really don't want to say a cliche here. Um, the biggest life lesson I've learned, I think it's really changed. Um, and, you know, it's that whole idea of sticking to sports or sticking to basketball when we do have such a voice and we do have that reach to, uh, you know, NBA has become, the NBA has become such a global sport and, you know, you have you know, hundreds, a billion, billions of people. I mean, if you've ever been to, to China, that culture is so... Uh, ingrained in basketball. I've been to the Philippines, Japan. Uh, I've traveled to all around the world, and 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 you know you see how much people love the sport of basketball, and that's that's just that's just basketball. I mean, we have so many athletes, men and women, who uh, have such a reach to so many people that can help elicit change and 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 start movements and uh, you know generate money towards towards great causes and you know, pay it forward to help that next person out. So I think the biggest thing that I've learned is that, uh, is to not stick to basketball, just stick to basketball, to if you can help or have a voice, do it. Um, be bold, be heard, and, uh, you know, never, uh, never be afraid to, to, to speak your truth because, you know, there's, there's always that, that next person going through something. You might know them, you might not. It might be you. It might be a person, like I said, at, at, at arm's length, but um, you can be that voice and you, you can be heard. Thank you. Great questions from everybody. Um, yeah. I have a couple more for you, just okay. a couple. Um, so what's, what's next on this 
on this journey that started a year and a couple weeks ago? Yeah, well, we, uh, we covered a lot of stuff in like the three minutes we spoke backstage, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, no, the question was asked like, is, you know, where, where does this fit in the, the um, you know, as far as the last six months and, and what you've done, like what, what have you, what have I done leading up to this point? And I think that this is a, uh, a major step. And I think as part of it is not only, it's like walking the walk, right? I, I wanna make sure that, that I am making positive steps in the right direction. And the, the biggest thing for me, uh, or why I see it going, at least where my fund is, uh, and I've worked with a lot of uh, you know, great, great funds and uh, great people already, um, which I'm very thankful for, but it's the younger demographic, I think, because I, I, I didn't understand it when I was young, and I, was, I put myself in, in, in such a hole early on that I, I learned about um, physical education, sexual education. Uh, I learned about um, you know, that sort of stuff, but I, ne I was never keen to, or, or uh, I was never taught that, you know, that there's, uh, you know, genetically you might be, you know, going through something in your brain. And I think circumstance plays such a small part so long as your, your basic needs are met. But then it's also, uh, you know, as the question was asked, like there's steps uh, you can take and, and ways that you can, you know, help yourself be ha happier on a daily basis. So I didn't have any of the, any of the tools when I was young. I wasn't taught it. And there wasn't, any course or, um, you know, you have your, you know, health classes, you have your, you know, you have the sex ed that's put in there and you have, you know, your PEs, you have your uh, extracurricular activities that you can, uh, uh, you know, exert um, your body and athletic performance, like certain things like that, but you never really tackled or, or faced the mental side early on. And I think that you have to, uh, you have to find a way to, to, to impact the, the younger generation. And I think it's all the way up through uh, college students as well, because you, know, you guys are who the people are gonna shift and, and you know, change the paradigm, paradigm and change the world. Um, I just have a couple takeaways. One, I think everybody who likes dogs, who are either in the audience or who are watching online should send uh, Kevin a tweet telling him <laughs> he should get a dog, what kind? Okay. Uh, I have a dog, it's great for, for your mental health. Um, tonight when I get home, I'm gonna break out my little gratitude journal and write, dear gratitude journal. Uh, I'm very thankful that I had a chance to, to uh, interview Kevin Love today and um, you're just making such a, such a po positive impact on, on, like you said, young people or older people, everybody who feels alone in, in, in something. And I know that I've personally felt it myself, and my friends and family have felt it, and I know that there's more than a handful of you who are in the audience who have felt it at some point in your life, and, and what you're doing is so helpful, and it it's, has nothing to do with your, with your uh, prowess in basketball, and I think that's, that's wonderful. So thank you very much, thank and thanks to, uh, thanks to Tufts University for, uh, for hosting us. It's been great, and all of you out there for coming and making this a wonderful evening. All the great questions from, from you guys in the audience and from all the watch parties around the country. This has been a really special evening. Um, thank you, Kevin Love. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Cool. Thanks a lot. Let me give you a big hug. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.